So I want to welcome everybody. Thank you for joining us today. Um, we do have quite a lot to share, so we're going to get started. Um, my name is Jacqueline Wood. I'm a clinical support specialist at FAU CARD, and um, we want to thank you for joining us for this special event. Uh, safety is a priority for us at FAU CARD, so we invited a number of um, partners from other community organizations to, uh, to share the ways that they're working to promote safety in a variety of different ways as well. So just a, a very quick overview of today. Um, we will first hear from Dr. Jack Scott, our executive director, and we'll talk a little bit about what CARD is doing to promote um, some of the, the safety resources and things that we provide for families. Um, and then we have a variety of community partners who, who will be presenting today. Um, as you can see on the on the screen and then at the end we will open it up for questions and answers so if you have questions as we go along please feel free to um, type them in the chat box and i will keep track of that and at the end i'll read them off um, if you do have a specific question for one of the panelists please feel free to address them directly so that we know who who that question is geared toward um, this webinar will be recorded so that we can share this information um, with others as well that aren't able to make it here today. So a little bit about FAU CARD. We're grant funded through the Florida Department of Education to provide free consultation, support, and training to um, individuals with autism, their families and friends, um, as well as professionals and community members who support them. And we cover a five county region. So we support individuals living in Indian River County, St. Lucie, Martin, Okeechobee, and Palm Beach counties. Um, currently, we are working remotely, but when we are face to face, we have three camp, three offices, uh, one on the FAU Boca campus, one on the FAU Jupiter campus, and one in Port St. Lucie. So I would like to now introduce our first presenter, Dr. Jack Scott. He is the executive director of FAU CARD and an associate professor in the Department of Exceptional Student Education. Dr. Scott serves on the board of the National Autism Society and has recently published a new book that's titled Safeguarding Your Child with Autism, which offers strategies for reducing risk for children with autism. So Dr. Scott, I'm gonna hand this over to you. Great. Thank you, Jackie. I appreciate it. And, um, uh, and thank you to uh, all of the parents and professionals who have tuned in and to all of the uh, presenters. Um, thank you for lending your time and your expertise uh, to, uh, to this important topic. Um, so uh, let me get, to, get right to it. Um, that we can consider the question, are children with autism at any greater risk for injury due to their autism? And uh, unfortunately, the answer is clearly yes on this. Uh, there are a growing number of studies that show, um, go back, uh, uh, last one, there we go. Uh, there are a growing number of studies that uh, look at this, they look at uh, injury calculation, they look at, oh geez, this is a sad subject, but mortality when children have died. Uh, we know, for example, that 10% of the children who drowned in Florida this is from 2017, were children with autism. Yet children with autism make up only about 1% of the population. Uh, they're very disproportionate in, in many, many sorts of, uh, of injuries. Uh, if you're a parent of a child with autism, you almost certainly know this, but if you don't already, then, it's, you know, then this is gonna be a, a, a big uh, awareness um, situation for you. And next slide, please. couple things that parents can do to reduce these, these risks. And my goal, and, I, and I'm sure the goal of our other presenters is not to scare you, um, uh, but rather to inform you. So the first uh, thing to do is, is to be aware that there is this problem. I know that uh, we were, it was about 2008, and um, we had card running on a satellite basis here for our region. And I wasn't aware of this special safety risk for these children. I'd heard the reports of children being injured, but I didn't put it together and realize there was a, uh, a pattern 
that was readily identifiable that children were, with autism were much more likely to be uh, injured. You have to be aware of this. You have to make sure your child's teacher, care providers, all members of your family and extended family are aware of these um, elevated risks. Next slide, uh, next uh, uh, click please. There you go. It's important to plan for emergencies and for those daily safety challenges that will come up. You will have perhaps challenges trying to get your child uh, buckled into their, into a, uh, their car seat. Uh, they may want to bolt when they get out of the, uh, the car seat and, and be at a risk in the parking lot. You have to plan for these to make sure that those things are controlled and your child safety is assured. You also have to plan, unfortunately, for things like an elopement or a poisoning that may occur. So the elopement, and I'll use the term elopement in place of wandering, you may know of wandering, but uh, this is a, a, a very, very common problem. And it is extraordinarily dangerous because for many children, it leads to drowning. But you should have a plan that is thought out and agreed upon by members of your family um, prior to any incident happening. Next one, uh, Jackie, please. For most of the children, um, you, you will want to make environmental modifications. You may need to strengthen uh, the door locks. You may need to put additional locks or latches higher up. You may, may need to go to additional concerns for your kitchen, um, keeping things uh, uh, locked up, perhaps in the garage that uh, other families would, would uh, leave in a kitchen. You may wish to make the kitchen a, yeah, right. a no-go zone altogether. It's best to not have younger children with autism um, feel that they can roam in the kitchen. They don't roam in your garage, I bet, in almost all cases because of the presence of dangerous items there. But you probably should not let them uh, just roam in the kitchen unless they're working directly with a parent. Um, the, the, that, that shouldn't happen. But there are other environmental modifications you want to make and uh, windows that may need to be secured. And certainly doors and windows out to a pool area need to be very carefully secured and, and alarmed. And you'll want to upgrade your monitoring and supervision of your child. Both electronic, you may need a home system. Um, even if you don't feel you're rich, it may be this, uh, the simplest, uh, simplest approach to get a, an ADP type of system um, uh, to, to help alert you if your child uh, does get out of the house. And monitoring needs to be up for all of these children. The frequency of it, the nature of it, um, unpredictable supervision is, is better, but um, very frequent monitoring um, is, is really important. So next slide, please. The elopement and drowning problem. In Florida, we're lucky. We've got water everywhere. We've got so many pools, ponds, canals, ocean, you name it. Um, but it, it creates a huge problem for children who drown. Actually, across the country, for children one to four years of age, um, drowning is the largest source of, of death. Uh, it is a huge and largely unrecognized problem. And we see it as an accident when it happens. And it, sadly, it, it is not an accident. It is mostly a failure of responsibility. Someone forgot to lock the door. Someone forgot to set the alarm. Someone, uh, there, there was a, uh, an open panel on the screen enclosure and it hadn't been fixed. So these things are not accidents. These are, these are um, failures on the part of adults. Um, but if a child does elope, uh, if they do get away from you where you do not know where the child is, uh, you want to get help on this right away. Next slide, uh, next click please. Behavioral services are essential. If your child starts to uh, show a pattern of elopement, this is not something you want to fiddle around with. I would urge you to uh, deal with a competent behavior services agency like Butterfly Effects, but there are many others. But with a BCBA, this is a serious problem. You need to get on top of this right away. Next, please. Dr. Scott, just real quick, could you move closer to the microphone? We're having trouble hearing you. Certainly. Okay. Uh, is that better? Better? I believe so. Yes, let's try that. Thank you. Electronic tracking. We're in, a, in an age now where the technology can help tremendously. And a simple kind of wristwatch-like electronic device can allow um, you as a parent to 
partner with local law enforcement, in our case, Palm Beach Sheriff's Office and other uh, law enforcement agencies up the coast to have electronic tracking. When your child is missing uh, and you don't know where they are, the search area could be huge. This kind of uh, device and the process that the law enforcement can use can allow your child to be recovered in 15 to 20 minutes in most cases. That is absolutely life-saving. Next one, please. Make sure your, your child's school knows, knows about the, the uh, problems your child may have in terms of elopement. I've found a number of families that just simply don't tell the school, thinking, well, you know, maybe they'll, um, they'll figure it out. You don't want to have something like this figured out. Uh, you want to make sure your child's teacher knows, that the front office knows, and that they're prepared to call it in, should the child get away from school, immediately and not insert a delay. The delay serves no one's purpose at all. So make sure that school is alerted and that they're careful. If your child has a one-to-one, -one, can that one-to-one -one keep up with your child if, if the child should decide to run away? And if not, um, ask that you get somebody who's, who's quicker and, and more capable. So uh, next, please. You should also be prepared for different risks at different ages. While drowning is huge for their children, with autism probably up to age, age 10, poisoning is also a huge, a huge risk for younger children, not so much for, for older and for, um, uh, for adults and adolescents. Transportation risks become huge and, and primary, uh, ages 11 up to 21 and then really beyond. Uh, but uh, not, so, uh, not quite as pr pronounced for the younger children. Although we do see a lot of transportation issues with kids uh, acting up in a car, uh, throwing things, uh, refusing to allow their seatbelt to be put on. And there you also need behavioral services. That's not something you want to tolerate. It results in a distracted driver who can endanger everyone on the road, including their own child and family. Bullying, self-injury, I hate to say this, but even suicide during adolescence and adulthood. The suicide is a, a the, the research is clear that there is an increased risk, uh, and we all need to be mindful of this. But uh, there are problems as, as children uh, age. Next slide, please. I urge families to make, in addition to making a plan, but to try to make your child's safety a family special interest. We know children with autism have a special interest. Most of them have at least one special interest. Some have, have many. Um, but make your child's safety a special interest for your family and for your child. It's possible now to buy books inexpensively, uh, picture books when the child's younger on uh, the risks of fires, falls, um, uh, electricity, uh, drowning, all of those things. Make sure that those are, read those, go over that with your child. Make sure your child is kind of a junior safety captain. We're not ready to leave and get the car going yet because Alyssa doesn't have her seatbelt on. I have mine on. That's what you want. These children are good with routine. Build it into their routine. And then lastly, celebrate freedom from injury, just as industry does. Our American industry has a tremendous good record of safety. Didn't always, uh, wasn't always that way. But uh, now um, American workers are, are largely free of workplace injuries in almost all industries. There are a few that are problematic. But uh, celebrate this in terms of we had a week with no, no, you know, nothing happening. We had a month where we didn't have any, um, uh, you know, uh, injuries and certainly on a, on a yearly basis. Make it important, celebrate it and share your successes with, with other families is, is my, my clear advice on this. I think that's my last one other than to say that work with CARD. If you start having a problem and you're, you're kind of stumped on it, uh, CARD is ready to help you on this. Um, we have some resources we can uh, use, but we have skill, expertise, um, and caring people who stand ready to, to help you with this. Thank you very much. And again, thank you to our, our presenters for giving your time and talent to, to us uh, this afternoon. I appreciate it. Yes. And thank you, Dr. Scott. You're very welcome. Um, that leads us right into some of the, the resources and supports that CARD can offer. Um, on top of this being certainly a special interest for our all CARD clinicians um, that can help families that, that are in need, um, especially safety-wise, but we also have been um, fortunate enough to receive grants from Autism Speaks to create safety boxes for our families. 
Um, so families that display a need for some of these materials, uh, the boxes have all sorts of different safety materials and resources um, in them from visual stop signs to put on windows and doors, um, window and door alarms to notify if somebody opens the door or the window. We have decals for first responders um, for both the house and in the car. Um, we have drowning prevention materials, poison prevention, um, disaster relief. So a variety of different um, supports in that box for our families to, to employ um, and to learn about measures of safety. Another opportunity that we have is um, a collaboration with Project Lifesaver International and um, Palm Beach County Sheriff's Office. So we are able to provide personal tracking devices um, to our families if the individual has shown a history of wandering or eloping. Um, you'll hear more about this, so I'm gonna be brief on that, but um, for our families that demonstrate a financial need, this is offered um, completely free of charge and we can provide the materials. Um, for the families that don't show the financial need, we can help to get them uh, set up with the device and then support them in keeping it maintained and um, any, any supports that they might need. We also do a variety of different law enforcement and first responder training. So um, our card clinicians are able to go into departments and provide an overview of autism um, and strategies for interacting and communicating with uh, individuals with autism. And then once a year, we bring in a national expert to do a more in-depth training for law enforcement, um, where he really gets into uh, the logistics of interacting, identifying with individuals um, or individuals with autism. And then finally, we do a variety of different community events, including um, we've done pizza nights with first responders where first responders come in in plain clothes and then put on their, their uniforms. Um, and it's just an informal night for our families to get to know first responders and first responders to get to know our families as well. Um, and we've done a day for autism that you'll hear about as well. So there's a variety of different events that we put together to, to form that relationship between our first responders and um, individual, our, our residents with autism. Becky, you may want to do a sound check, please. Can you hear me okay? I, I can. Can others? Okay, we're good now? Okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, so next we have a few uh, community partners that we want to highlight today. Um, I would like to first introduce um, Dr. Steve Wolf, president of Butterfly Effects. Okay, I, am I on here? You're on, yes. Okay, great. So it sounds like uh, you're going to control the advancement of the slides, is that right? Yes, I will. So if you just wanna cue me. Um, All right, uh, you know, of course I edited my slides late last night and sent updates in yesterday. I hope we have the right presentation. Right. Yes, uh, it's updated. Uh, you know. <laughs> um, first off, I, I wanna thank you, um, you know, for having such an important event. One of my favorite things to do is to uh, present in front of parents who are dealing with some real issues, especially given the current environment. Um, really appreciate being here. So uh, my presentation, can we go to the next slide, please? Okay. So my press, can we go, you can hit all of the, um, okay, and stop right there. So my presentation is really going to be focused on some dangerous behaviors that a lot of our kids um, who are affected by autism spectrum disorder encounter. Now, there's a lot that you can do. And first off, um, we had a little bit, I think, I want to make sure everyone can hear me and that the audio is clear. I'm seeing heads nod. Okay, terrific. If not, I have the chat up so you can um, chat me if you feel like the audio is not strong enough. Uh, so a lot of our kids are really in dangerous situations. Um, can we go to the next slide, please? In the next slide. So when we look at children with autism, we notice that when we look at the research, almost between 33 and 71 percent have self-injurious behavior that causes serious harm to themselves. The next bullet, please. And you can hit all of the bullets and just hit it twice more. And we'll stop right there. 
And we noticed that 71% of our kids have stereotypic behavior where they'll engage in a self-stimulatory behavior and a good percentage of them have aggression towards others. And we see that parents of children with autism are affected by elopement about 49% of the time. So if you're a family member and you haven't dealt with um, elopement, it is a fairly common thing to deal with if, you're a, if you have a, um, a child or sibling um, affected by autism. Can we go to the next uh, slide, please? Okay, and feeding problems are also one of the things that parents are constantly dealing with. Can we go to the next slide? And PICA is as well. <laughs> I really did a comprehensive job putting these together. Uh, if you don't know what pica is, pica is when you take an uh, object that's not meant to be eaten, you put it in your mouth, and many people swallow them. Pica and, and then elopement are seen as two really significant problem behaviors because they can result in serious medical harm. So let's go to the next um, slide, please. So elopement is really bolting. It's when you leave a supervised area and you're without the supervision and without the proximity of a caregiver. So elopement has also been associated with serious medical conditions. For example, children get seriously injured sometimes when they're on their own. Can we go to the next slide, please? So anyway, at this point, so it's, it's a significant variable. And the consequences are you could 65% when in some instances there's traffic injury and then in some instances there's drowning as well. So what I'm trying to tell you here is that bolting happens or elopement happens. It's fairly common to families, but at the same time it happens for a reason. Now there's all kinds of ways that you could prevent bolting or elopement from happening. But the fact is, is that you could put extra locks on the doors, you could do higher levels of supervision, but I wanna give you a strategy for decreasing elopement that maybe you haven't thought of, and that's looking at the functioning, the function of behavior. I've worked with elopement for many, for 25 years, and I could remember that I had one individual who was an adult who would elope from a work center whenever they heard a lawnmower and he would run out of the place and he would just run towards the sound of a lawnmower. We, very reinforcing for him. But the problem was is that he never looked both ways when he crossed the street or ran across the street. So as soon as this individual started running, what would happen is, is that we would have to chase him immediately because we knew that he was not being safe. And so we had to teach him the skill of asking to go leave the facility and we would walk him across the street and teach him how to walk across the street. So identifying these problems and sort of identifying the function of why is somebody eloping is really important. Can we go to the next slide, please? And you could see here that two real problems with eloping are that individuals are not looking when they run across the street because they're eloping somewhere and they don't have the safety skills to cross the street or sometimes they'll jump into a pool because it's so reinforcing if they see it. Can we go to the next slide? So what does this all mean is the question and how is this helpful to families? Can we go to the next um, slide, please? What we wanna figure out is that if we have elopement behavior and somebody is leaving our house or leaving an unsupervised area, we have to look at what the payoff is or what is the function. It's gonna be, you can't always give 24 hours of supervision to your child, no matter how diligent you are. So if you have a child who's engaging in elopement behavior, we wanna figure out why they're eloping or what the payoff is to elopement. So this is where a behavior analyst could be very helpful to you because we need to find out why it's so reinforcing for a child to leave the home or leave supervision. Can we go to the next slide, please? So there's been some studies on this. And a lot of times what we find are when kids are eloping, about 50% of the time their behavior is maintained by something called positive reinforcement. So what this means is that when a child elopes, we wanna figure out why they're eloping or what the function is. In many situations, they're eloping because it could be that they enjoy the attention of being chased. Now this I had happen at a local Florida school with a young boy who was eloping all the time. And what we noticed is that when he was being chased, he would like look back and laugh at everybody because he thought it was hilarious. 
Of course, we were petrified because he was running through streets. But knowing that this child was eloping because he was getting attention from the teacher, from the principal, and he was getting this heightened level of attention made the intervention really easy because we were able to give him that attention without engaging in the problem behavior. So the other reason that we see people eloping is because they're running towards items that they want. And this could be a pool. Um, kids will know that a pool exists down the street where they've seen it. And so what they will absolutely do is um, run towards that. So they're not asking permission. They're just going because they want the item. So these are two things that would be considered maintained by positive reinforcement when you look at the um, problem behavior. And I think as a parent, that's the first thing you wanna do is figure out why does my child elope? What is the function? Another reason why kids elope, and I see this in schools a lot, is because they're trying to escape the environment. So they could be in an environment like a school where there's a lot of work demands and they said, forget this, I'm going home. And they'll elope from schools and they'll elope from other places in a sense to escape a task demand or to get away from something. So can we go to the next slide, please? So what we try to do, I think as behavior analysts, is it's critical that we, st we step back and we identify what the function of elopement is. Like why is the person leaving? And then once we figure that out, if we could say, they're leaving because they want to you know, run to their neighbor's house because they get attention there, or because I like the way that people scream and yell every time I go, it's a heightened level of attention, or because I'm gonna to run to the grocery store because I want a cookie. You know? But the fact is, is that identification of function should be your first thought. You know? So when your child's not eloping, you should think, okay, what is the function of that behavior? Why is this child engaging and what's the payoff for them? that allows us to really design a really strong intervention plan. So if we want to eliminate the behavior of elopement, we're going to have to figure out what that function is and design intervention around that. Can we go to the next slide, please? So one of the interventions that we use is something called functional communication. Can we go to the next slide, please? So with functional communication is we wanna teach our kids to ask permission to leave the, to leave the area. So we want to teach them almost permission skills so they can ask us and request where they want to go. What we want to do is we want to replace elopement with a socially acceptable behavior, such as asking permission or figuring out what they want. If they do want, let's say, a cookie from the grocery store, we want to teach the child how to ask for a cookie so we can give them a easier way to kind of meet their reinforcers so they do not elope. This is a very kind of complex process that I've broken down into a very simple way, but usually this is where behavior analysts can really work with families to figure out why a child's eloping, then teach them a skill so they can get what they want without engaging in a dangerous behavior. Can we go to the next slide, please? So there's all kinds of ways that we can teach a child through functional communication. Because you can say, well, my child doesn't have vocal skills, they can't ask but we could teach a child how to tap us on the shoulder. We could teach them how to use a, um, a picture exchange communication system, or we could teach them signing. But we have to teach them the, be placement, the replacement behavior because we have to get elopement under control. Now, of course you have to do whatever you, I mean, you have to do as a parent to save your child if they're eloping from the house and running into the street. You know, you have to chase them, you have to find them. But then I think secondly, you have to think about the function of behavior and then how are we gonna teach them a replacement skill so this doesn't become a long-term problem that we're dealing with for years and years. Can I have the next slide, please? So anyway, this is another way that we teach um, children who have elopement issues. So sometimes we see children who elope because they're trying to escape the environment. They could be trying to escape the environment because they don't like what's happening at school. So we teach them how to functionally communicate that they want a break. We put a, a, a schedule in place so they can see when the breaks are happening. We teach them sign language for break if they don't have the vocal skills. But again, I think what I'm trying to emphasize here is that 
these behaviors don't magically go away. You have to teach these functionally equivalent replacement behaviors if you want a long-term solution to elopement. Can I have the next uh, slide, please? And the next one. Okay. The other thing that we do when we have cases of elopement is we try to teach these kids safety skills. Elopement is a really difficult behavior to get under stimulus or to get under control. So what we try to do is teach the replacement behavior, but we have to teach these kids how to cross the street appropriately. We have to teach these kids how to work, how to walk around a pool appropriately. We have to teach these kids how to ask for help or how to use the visual aids as well. We also have to give this child a wallet so that in the event that they do escape, they can always pull out their wallet and show it to somebody to see where they are. Um, you know, so these are things that we do on a regular basis for our kids on the spectrum. You know, it's a very difficult behavior, of course, to deal with elopement. My advice to you is that if you do have a child who's eloping, I would definitely try to get a behavior analyst involved, do a functional behavior assessment, get replacement skills in place, and then teach them the safety skills. I think that's best practice for when we have to, um, you know, I think deal with these, um, you know, extreme behaviors as well. Can I have the next slide? So what I want to leave you with, and I only had eight minutes to talk about this, so I hope I didn't do any damage. But the fact is, is that identification of function of be the function of behavior is critical. Do what you can to protect your child, but then you have to sit back and you have to think, what is the payoff to the elopement behavior? Why are they running to pools? Why are they running out of my home? Where are they going and what's the function? So with that, we can identify interventions that can permanently, you know, hopefully decrease that behavior. But it doesn't happen magically. We have to teach these kids. We have to make sure that we teach them functional communication skills. We have to make sure we teach them safety skills. And that's something that takes a little bit of time to develop. I will tell you that um, I've dealt with elopement quite a bit in my career. Um, what I'm seeing elopement happening now is in nursing homes where a lot of individuals, a lot of older individuals will leave nursing homes and elope. And when we do functional analysis on these individuals, we find that they elope for the same reasons that our kids with autism elope because they're not getting a high level of attention possibly. They want additional stimulation in their environment. They're trying to escape what they consider to be a stagnant environment. So I wanted to leave you with that, that I hope that instead of just thinking about the crisis of elopement, we could think about the function and how to design intervention around it. Um, can I have the next? Um, okay. Um, I only had eight minutes. I hope I did a good job for you. Um, again, it, I'm certainly willing to answer any questions about this. And thank you for having me. Absolutely. Thank you, Dr. Wolf. And thank you um, for your continued support of FAU CARD. And we do have a, a brief video for butterfly effects. Butterfly Effects is a national leader in providing access to evidence-based treatment for families affected by autism spectrum disorder. With the rates of autism diagnoses on the rise, Butterfly Effects family-focused approach on services incorporates prescribed teaching, child's daily routines, and family involvement to obtain successful outcomes. What makes Butterfly different from other providers is it's the intersection of science and compassionate care. Of course, we work on the core deficits of autism, socialization, behavior reduction, communication as well, but we're also interested in what's important to families. Going to a mom and saying, what do you want us to work on today with, with their child? And it might be something like, I'd like to see my child hug me in the morning, or I'd like to see my child interact with their grandfather, or I'd like my child to sit and listen to a story when dad reads. Those things are just as important to us as teaching functional communication skills. Butterfly Effects attempts to start treatment as early as possible. Treatment should be intensive, supportive of families, and implemented by trained professionals. Butterfly Effects has a dedicated professional development department that not only provides initial staff training, but training throughout an employee's tenure so they are current with the latest treatment developments. Here at Butterfly Effects, we want to provide the best treatment environment for our families as well as our clinicians. 
Therefore, we provide services in a variety of settings, including home, community, and school-based services, as well as clinics in some of our areas. We completely understand that it can be very uncomfortable and intrusive to have a new person come into your home. Therefore, we really work hard to make the whole family unit feel comfortable from the very beginning of assessment as well as throughout the time that we are providing treatment. Butterfly Effects is working to ensure that all families affected by autism spectrum disorder have access to effective treatment by teaming with families, measuring outcomes, and bringing quality treatment into homes. Butterfly Effects is changing lives. Wow, well, thank you for playing our video. I had know that was gonna happen. Um, you know, um, well, hey, it's, it's our honor to support FAU regardless. Um, you guys do great work there. And um, I'm just glad that we can be a small part of that. So thank you. Absolutely, and thank you for providing such uh, relevant and, and important information. We appreciate you. Um, Next, I'd like to introduce Zippy Rosen, another uh, community supporter. Um, she's with special, she's the special needs community liaison and outreach coordinator for Rails Jewish Family Services. So Zippy, I'm gonna turn this over to you now. Okay, hi everyone, thanks for having me. Um, and I um, echo what Steve said that, you know, FAU CARD does amazing work and we're glad to partner with you guys. So what I do is we don't do um, programming per se. Um, we kind of more support the families uh, as far as, you know, even safety. So my PowerPoint's more generally kind of what I, what we um, offer and then also how we can help with them. Um, so as Jackie said, I'm the special needs community liaison and outreach worker for Ruth and Norman Rails Jewish Family Services. We are located in Boca. Um, we work with all families. You do not have to be Jewish to get services from us. Um, we recognize the enormous emotional and financial challenges special needs families face. Um, and we offer a number of supports for parents, siblings, and caregivers of special needs family member, including financial assistance, individual counseling, support groups for parents, grandparents, and siblings, information and referral, and JFS Connect, which is our adult special uh, adult case management program. Um, so for financial assistance, um, for that, you need to live in our catchment area, which is Boca, Delray, and Highland Beach. Um, <clears throat> we have, um, it's a process, you have to fill out some paperwork and, and give us some supporting documents, but if you qualify, we can offer financial assistance, um, you know, up to a certain point for therapies, um, including ABA um, equipment, shadows, respite care, et cetera, et cetera, including, you know, um, safety is in that. We can help if someone is in desperate need of a safety water class, that's something, and they can't afford it, they could come to me and we could try to help them. Um, you know, putting safety things in place in the home. That's also something that we can assist with maybe financially. Um, <clears throat> and then there's basic safety needs like living and electric and all that. And we have helped families with rent, FPL, um, utilities, et cetera, et cetera. So those are all things that we could help as far as um, financial assistance. Um, we also currently have a special fund for those affected by COVID. Um, if someone's income has decreased, if they either lost their job, were furloughed, were put to part time, they can apply to us and it's a little more streamlined and we could assist them through our special COVID fund. And we ha also have a food pantry um, that goes also through regular financial assistance or COVID um, that's streamlined as well for families that live in our catchment area. Um, individual counseling. So if, if a family comes to me and they, are going through crisis or just kind of need some assistance, um, I can meet with them for a few brief sessions. Um, I'm really whatever the need is that they're going through. And also, you know, safety wise, I could help them come up with a plan or just kind of help them to assess their safety situation at home and what we can do with that. If um, someone is in need of longer term counseling, then we can refer them to our counseling department. 
Um, we have kept up with counseling um, through telehealth, um, you know, whether it's through a computer or the phone. We're actually slowly um, starting to open up, I believe, as well um, for the counseling back in person for those that are comfortable. And we have a new expanded counseling department that's including child and senior psychiatry, which is a huge need in the community. Um, because we could do sliding fee if the family is in need, again, if they show documentation. Um, but just, I had a client of mine um, who I've worked with for, with both autism and Down syndrome, and the mom called the office um, for him to see a psychiatrist. So this is something that she couldn't really do in the past because she couldn't afford one. So we're hopefully gonna work with her. Um, you know, if you need information more about that, you can either ask me or we have an intake department. Um, support groups. So I've been with JFS for five years and we, the whole time since I've been there, we've been um, doing parent and caregiver support groups. Um, and about three years ago, we started co-facilitating them with JAFCO. Um, and through those groups, um, you know, we're there to support the parent or the caregiver through anything that they need and safety does come up a lot as well, um, where parents can talk to the other parents and get ideas of what they've done for safety wise for their, for their children. Um, also a couple years ago, we started a grandparent support group with JAFCO um, and we've been meeting virtually since COVID started for all these groups and attendance has been great, even better sometimes than in person. <laughs> um, and sibling, we were doing sibling groups for a little bit. That kind of, um, even before COVID, we found it kind of falling through, but I am actually taking a course in October for sib shops. I'm gonna be trained. So I'm hoping once I do that, we're gonna get back up and running with sibling groups. So I'm very excited about that. Um, information and referral. I get calls from everywhere and anywhere from anyone. Um, just regarding services in the area. I would also just to say support groups are open to everyone. You do not have to live in our catchment. Um, and information and referral. So I get calls from people from anywhere, people who are thinking of moving to Florida, um, what we have here. Um, if, and I'll speak to anyone. You don't, again, have to be in our catchment. Um, anything from housing, which is a big topic, um, you know, as individuals are, you know, living longer, housing is a big issue of where they're going to live. Um, jobs, therapists, social activities, respite care classes. Um, I have um, resource sheets on like each of these topics that I can easily send out to families. And through Federation, the Jewish Federation of South Palm Beach County, who I also work with, we have an, a website. It's called the Jewish Abilities Alliance. And it's an online resource guide. So that's something you can also, um, you know, visit. But um, and I try, you know, in the website, I'm constantly updating it, but I have all our vendors that, you know, all our partners that we work with, and then some, and, you know, even safety and swimming lessons and et cetera, et cetera. And the last thing we do, we have a program called JFS Connect, which is um, adult special needs case management. Um, and we have a case manager that works with the families. Um, you know, a lot of times we get calls anywhere from, you know, adults on the spectrum to adults with mental illness. It kind of runs the gamut. Um, and the case manager is really there to help the client and the family navigate, whether it's finding a job, whether it's hooking them up with social groups like FAU cards, you know, adult social groups, um, doing, you know, benefits. Um, you know, sometimes kids don't want to listen to their parents, especially adult kids. So bringing in a third party um, has really helped some of these clients, you know, move forward um, with um, things that they really want to get done. Um, we continue the services under COVID. She's just really been working more remotely, but she keeps in touch with the clients and their families on a regular basis. That is our one fee for service program. Um, everything else there are no costs to. Um, we also do, I do respite care trainings. Actually, we partner with FAU Card and we have one coming up on October 6th. Um, we're doing it virtually where um, and it, someone can be trained to be a respite care worker. We have book uh, that we follow a, a curriculum. Um, so if anyone wants any more information about anything you know, that I've talked about, which I'm sure I left stuff out, 
please feel free to reach out. Um, and again, thank you, FAU, for uh, FAU card for having me and doing the great work and all of your organization. So, and the video that I have, just to give it a disclaimer, it's not specific to special needs. So I don't know if you want to show it or not. It's more general JFS because that's all we had. <laughs> but. Okay. Well, we'll show it. Um, and, and again, thank you, Zippy. Thank you so much for your continuous support. Um, we, we really value your collaboration. And we will show the video. It starts with a phone call, an email, someone walking through our front door. They come to us after their mother is gone, while going through a divorce and trying to rebuild their life, when the lights are about to be turned off. We are Ruth and Norman Rail's Jewish Family Services. For 40 years, we have been providing help, hope, and humanity to our community by assisting all of our neighbors in need. JFS has provided critical services to more than 15,000 people each year and continues to make a positive impact in every possible way, ensuring that the most fundamental needs of our community are met with food and financial assistance, and providing those needing help navigating life's transitions, access to counseling and mental health services, supporting victims of abuse on their road to safety. We help families gain employment and provide financial assistance for children to have productive summers while allowing their parents to work. Through JFS's Senior Services Department and our Carolink Case Management and Holocaust Survivor Assistance Programs, we ensure the safety, dignity, and independence of elderly individuals while enabling them to age in a place where they are most comfortable. All the care and assistance we provide couldn't be possible without the tireless help of our dedicated volunteers. They offer friendly companionship to homebound adults, mentoring youths in need of adult guidance. They even ensure that struggling families get to celebrate the holidays and so much more. We would never be able to help as many people as we do without the dedication and compassion of our staff volunteers, community partners, and donors. We are ever grateful for the help, hope, and humanity you provide. Because of you, today, we are part of an even stronger community. You are the family in Ruth and Norman Rail's Jewish Family Services. Excellent. Thank you so much, Zippy, for sharing all that wonderful information. Um, next, we're going to go to some, some additional community partners um, who have joined us. Next up is Dr. Jimenez Gomez. He is a neurologist with Joe DiMaggio Children's Hospital. Can you all hear me? Yes. Great. Well, thank you for the invitation. I uh, you know, I'm a neurologist and neurodevelopmentalist at Joe DiMaggio, so I work a lot with the community uh, in patients with autism and other uh, intellectual and developmental disabilities. Uh, you can go ahead and move to the next slide. I think I'll just emphasize a little bit of what has been discussed before by both Dr. Scott and Dr. Wolf and kind of focus in on a couple of other details. Certainly not as eloquent as Dr. Wolf in, in the description of elopement, but I will say, you know, in, in, in part from what he mentioned at some point in regards to elopement across the, the, the lifespan, uh, you know, elopement can be a very normal child behavior. Uh, it's the inherent lack of awareness of danger that, you know, toddlers have the search for a specific gratification or a specific cause or an escape from a specific uh, um, uh, situation without that safety awareness that you know is not unusual and not uncommon by any means in you know like an 18 month old or a 24 month old but in the case of obviously uh, folks with autism because of the disorganized development this persists over time and there is 
a disproportionate response. There's not, you know, a, a significant degree of uh, uh, information that we could extrapolate to say all individuals have the same profile or the same causes, but oftentimes, as as, as uh, Dr. Wolf had mentioned, uh, we're extensively and and uh, more precisely before identifying why, whether it's an evasion of some situation, uh, uh, response to an overstimulation, a response to uh, some potentially rewarding uh, situation, running to find something or running from somebody in a playful manner and whatnot is, is probably the most important factor here. And obviously the risks that you incur are similar for children with and without autism or for individuals with and without autism or with any developmental uh, disability. You know, you run out into the street and you put yourself in danger, you run into any body of water and you put yourself in danger. I would, uh, you know, place emphasis on what Dr. Scott had mentioned that, you know, there's a huge number of accidental deaths uh, related to drowning in a population with and without autism from ages one to four. The one thing I would emphasize on, and this is not within the realm of autism exclusively, but for any child one to four with any any behavior is that most drownings actually tend to occur in the bathtub. So that's the, the simplest circumstances are often ones that we, you know, are not quite as vigilant of. And still a four-year-old can very much drown in a bathtub just as they can drown in a 50-meter pool or whatever it is. But what we do have in, in regards to autism, in regards to the bodies of water, which is a little bit more of the focus of the conversation, is that there are certain times of day and certain circumstances that are uh, uh, that put us at risk uh, for individuals with autism, particularly, at, you know, a, a little bit of the research that has been done because it's fortunately not particularly quite as common. Uh, but, you know, afternoon hours or into the evening hours where there's fewer instances of supervision and then bodies of water that are unprotected close to the home. And we are at a particular risk, obviously, in South Florida where we have an abundance of pools, but we also have an abundance of canals, but we also have the ocean, but we also have uh, uh, all sorts of other inlets and whatnot. So vigilance to that end is, is key. Now, from the neurological perspective, uh, what I'd like to place emphasis on is the time-sensitive aspect of it. It's, it's never what it is on television. It's never in the sequence or the dramatized manner in which you tend to see these situations on television. Unfortunately, the large majority of uh, patients who, you know, I've, I've had the misfortune to see in Florida or in Texas before that or in Ohio before that, it's been a very simple and straightforward circumstance in which there's a, a brief time lapse. And I would say that that's the most important aspect for every parent to consider is that it takes a very, very small a fraction of time to actually cause significant impact. I don't mean to scare anybody with this, but to emphasize the importance of continued vigilance. Now, children who are spotted sooner within this circumstance, which even the most vigilant of parents can you know, go into, uh, children who are spotted in time, removed from the water and assisted in time, who are conscious of time of arrival, to the hospital have better outcomes, we know that much. There's uh, you know, a good understanding of what represents the danger to the brain and to the lungs and whatnot and what time frame to observe and whatnot. But what I'll emphasize on that is that even if there's a, there's a lapse, there's a time to remove to assist. We also know that better training in how to assist children bodes better outcomes. Children who have spent a long time or had not received assistance up until the point of arrival of, of EMS or into the hospital are at much higher risk of having significant uh, uh, neurological outcomes or significant health outcomes and even uh, brain death or death. So you can go on to the next, the next slide. Uh, so I, you know, I always like to think of this as, you know, you must prevent, but you also need to plan. You need to be aware that even the most vigilant, even the most prepared family needs to assume that this still may happen for whichever reason. We all know, you know, we have children that have and don't have developmental disabilities that are 
still bright enough to open something or to or to elope in one or another way. They figure it out, and we need to assume what do we do, if and when. So I, I'll emphasize on some of the prevention strategies that we have already talked about. There's a number of tools and and strategies for securing the home that we're real you know familiar with in South Florida, particularly securing a pool or securing you know, the front gates and the the yard and whatnot to prevent the elopement or, any, you know, jumping into a pool and whatnot. But obviously that goes hand in hand with what Dr. Wolf had mentioned extensively, which is how do we train the children to functionalize some of the behaviors and some of the communication and to gain some of those skills, which is the, the core aspect of how behavioral uh, functional behavioral analysis and behavioral uh, therapies help in this context now I, I i underline designated eyes here because we all have pools for a leisure purpose in south florida or there's a number of pools for leisure purpose and we go to the beaches and whatnot and the intent typically is to have fun and for everybody to have fun and but across the board you know we have to have somebody that's vigilant of any specific child at any specific time. Not a single individual looking at everybody, but an individual looking at one specific child at risk, having kind of the designated uh, observer, so to speak. And informing your community and having those close to you and around you is important, similar to what we have talked about with having the wallet and the information of the medical history. I'd say tracking devices are a, a very useful tool, but I don't want those to be false reassurance necessarily. Those eyes still need to be on the children. Uh, and then the planning ahead aspect, as I said, you know, better support early on boats better outcomes. So training and basic life support for parents is one of those resources we're always looking to partner with in the community. Uh, folks such as uh, uh, the FAU card program and whatnot that have a more extensive reach for parent education and parent support are a wonderful resource in this end. And then obviously what we're doing over here today, which is how to engage first responders, how to have those folks who are our front line uh, know how to react to the situation with a, uh, with a child, but particularly in this case with a child with autism. That's all I have. Excellent. Thank you, Dr. Jimenez Gomez. Um, some really great information. Uh, next, I'd like to introduce uh, Deborah Dietz, the Executive Director of the Disability Independence Group. Okay. Can hear you now. Okay, excellent. Then I'm going to start. Hi, my name is Debbie Dietz, and I'm the Executive Director of Disability Independence Group, or DIG. We are a nonprofit advocacy center for disability rights, and we're located in Miami, Florida. Our mission is to expand opportunities for participation, education, employment, and acceptance of persons with disabilities through advocacy, litigation, education, and training. And today I'm gonna to tell you about a few of our projects. So we can switch to the next slide, please. Deborah, could you maybe speak up just a little bit? I think some are having difficulty hearing you. Sure, is this, if I hold the microphone, is this better? I, I think so. Okay. Um, our first project that I wanna talk to you about is our wallet card project. And this is actually a project we did in conjunction with um, UMNSU card, which is the card office in Miami, Florida, and one of our local police departments. And this project is, was created to help people with disabilities find a way to safely disclose their disability to law enforcement. And in this project, we make a custom wallet card or communication tool that tells the officer about the person with the disability. The card includes the person's name, their disability, and some basic characteristics about their disability, such as the person might not make eye contact, they may need extra time to answer questions, and they may be so nervous that they have trouble communicating. We also tell them to not assume that this behavior means the person is suspicious of doing something wrong. 
And on the back of the card, we add an emergency contact name and phone number so that the officers can call and get more information if they need in order to assess a situation. And then what's so nice about the card is that we can actually add two custom statements that are unique and specific for that person that has the card. And this could be, I might flap my hands, where it's right if you did in front of an officer might be seen as aggressive and the officer might escalate the situation when in, in fact, that's what that person does all the time or pace back and forth or repeat what they're saying. So we can actually customize the card so that it's useful for the person that's holding it. Now, we do have two requirements for this project. The first is that the person must be 14 years or older, the assumption being that they're out in the community without a parent or caregiver. And the second is that the person must be verbal enough to say, can I show you my wallet card? And this is for the protection of the individual. We don't want someone reaching for the card or going into a pocket or a bag without letting the officer know what they're doing because we don't wanna take a really good idea and create a bad situation because the person didn't disclose or, or ask permission before they reach for the card. Now we know that this doesn't solve the problem for every person, but this unique project that we've created is for a unique part of the population and for that population, it does work. I, we'd love to ultimately expand the project and make another card for either younger children or individuals that are not as verbal. But right now, that's not the role of our project. All right, so we also, the second part of the project is that we have a police training and it's available for any police department or law enforcement agency. And this training tells the officers what to do if someone hands them a card. Because if we haven't trained the officers, we've only solved half of the problem. So we need to explain to the officers what to do and what this card means. And in your specific area, your Port St. Lucie Police Department has received the training and has implemented the project. None of the other departments in your area have, but we're willing and would love to give it to them and share it with them when they're ready. And you can get more information on our project on our website. The cards can be ordered on our website. They're 100% free and the police training is free. And we have a video that's on our website that shows the individual how to safely use the card. And there's different hypothetical scenarios that show what to do in different police interactions. <laughs> I'm looking in the chat box. Someone's saying yes. <laughs> we can reach if you guys, we can talk and you guys can help us and we can reach out to them and get it to that police department. The second project I want to tell you about it as quickly is Carter Supper Social Club. And this is a neurodiverse dinner. It started in person in Miami, but because of COVID, we, we switched it to a virtual event and it's actually been able to expand to all over the country. And it's, it's just a place to have a conversation, right? To go in theory, when we started, go out to dinner, eat dinner, talk, hang out. There's no agenda. There's no um, kind of pro process for the day. We just go out and have dinner and talk. We talked about superheroes. I'll make it Jackie. We talked about superheroes, movies, just fun stuff. Our next one is October 5th at 6 30 p.m. And I believe some of your FAU card adults have been attending the last few and it's been fun to expand it and include more people than just Miami. The last thing I want to tell you real quick is we're doing a voting rights summit on disability issues on October 6th from 9 to 1. And as we know, voting impacts our laws and how our laws are implemented. So if you guys want to be part of it, it'll be virtual and it will be on October 6th from nine to one. So I know I'm out of time. So thank you so much for letting me be here today. And um, if you have any questions, you can email me. Thank you. Thank you, Deborah. And yes, we have lots of our adults that attend and, and have had a wonderful experience. So thank you for all of that great information. Um, next, I'd like to introduce Chief Jean Saunders, who's the founder and uh, CEO of Project Lifesaver International. So Jean, I'm gonna hand this over to you now.
Can you hear us, Gene? I can hear you. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you. Can okay, hear you. good, good. I, uh, you notice we had a little problem there. Well, one of the reasons there's no video is we seem to have a uh, camera connection problem. I am currently at our operations office in Chesapeake, Virginia, and we're just not connecting very well to, uh, to the Zoom server here as far as video. However, uh, Project Lifesaver uh, is a nonprofit, and we are specifically deal with the cognitive issues of autism and Alzheimer's wandering. Uh, we started it specifically for Alzheimer's to deal with, uh, with that particular type of uh, wandering. And shortly thereafter, uh, we noticed, or in, through other ways, we found out that autism uh, now or then had a growing problem, and we also that. Um, member agencies in 50 states and eight provinces in Canada, and we are getting ready up Western Australian police. Now, how do we do this? Well, we train these uh, agencies. But I'll describe in a few minutes uh, how to use it, how to operate the program, but we also give them a familiarization on the people they're going to be dealing with and how to interact with them. It's one thing to locate them, it's another thing to get them in the car and get them back home. Uh, there's some skills that, that uh, are tangent to that. We operate with radio frequency locating equipment. Uh, person, uh, the agencies will place a uh, radio transmitter wristband with the person. If they uh, should elope or wander, that agency will be notified. They will respond into the area using the training that they have received, locate the radio signal, track to it, locate the person, and bring them back. Uh, we, this is not GPS. Before I'm asked that question, and I get it all the time, we don't use GPS because in this kind of situation, there's too many failures. Uh, we are very proud that our member agencies, since we started 21 years ago, have made almost 3,800 recoveries safely and effectively within an uh, average time of 30 minutes. We have found that lately the biggest uh, population that we deal with is on the spectrum, uh, especially in the Florida area or during warm weather, there seems to be a lot more elopements. And we do receive after action reports from all of our agencies that make the rescues and recoveries so that we can uh, denote the uh, information around this particular incident as to how far away they were, where they were, the time it was, the time of day and the weather such as that. Uh, we have two offices. Our headquarters is in Port St. Lucie, Florida, and our operations and training office is here in Chesapeake. Uh, they deal with the equipment and setting up of the training. Uh, I think, you know, the down and dirty is, that probably covers uh, Project Lifesaver. Uh, it is a locating, organization that trains and works with public safety. So the persons living in a particular area, such as Port St. Lucie, can contact either the uh, Port St. Lucie Police Department or in the county, the St. Lucie County Sheriff's Office, who can provide them the services. If you'd like to get some more information on Project Lifesaver, you can call us and the number's on the screen, or you can go to our website, which is also on the screen, projectlifesaver.org. Uh, I think until we get to the questions, Jackie, that pretty much covers it. Um, thank you for your time. I appreciate it. And uh, we're honored to work with FAU Card and Dr. Jack Scott. And thank you for this uh, time to uh, allow me to describe our program. Absolutely. Thank you, Gene. Um, and again, we're, we are 
honored to work with Project Lifesaver too. Um, you can always contact for the families that are in our catchment area, can contact CARD as well um, if in need of a, a bracelet and we can help make that connection too. So thank you, Jean. Um, next, I'd like to introduce Anna Stewart, the manager of the Drowning Prevention Coalition of Palm Beach County. Hi, everybody. Hi. Can, can you hear me? Are yeah. we good? Anna, yeah. okay, I just love this technology. It's fantastic. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, so basically, we're encouraging everybody to be water safe and water smart year round. Obviously, this is very important for children uh, who have autism. I've been with the coalition for almost 20 years now. With regards to Palm Beach County drowning stats, we average about 48 drowning deaths per year. We have drownings occurring year round. Most often, however, it's usually during the summertime. Number one place where drownings happen is pools, followed by the ocean, and then motor vehicle crashes and bodies of water is the third leading cause of drowning in this county. Oftentimes when we think about drowning, we think, oh, children, 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 which is true, but every age group drowns. But in particular, particular in Palm Beach County, it's seniors that have the highest drowning rate in Palm Beach County, not children. But then again, you figure who's the majority of our population is seniors. So with that being said, we just want to make sure that everybody is aware that regardless of your age, race, gender, and socioeconomic background, everyone is susceptible to drowning. And even if you know how to swim, you can still drown. So what does the coalition do? Well, we educate. Our job is to go out into the community and provide free water safety programming to anybody who's willing to listen to us talk. So we go into uh, preschools, elementary schools, middle schools, high schools, homeowner associations, parent groups, we do special needs classes. And we also go to a lot of health and safety fairs where we hand, well, not now because of COVID, but we do hand out water safety swimming information at health and sa safety fairs. So if your organization is having one of those in the near future, you know, next year when we can do it in person, we'll be more than happy to come. This is something that's really important for everybody to, everybody to know is that we have a free reduced cost swim program for children ages two through 12. Children that are special needs automatically qualify for this program as long as they don't know how to swim and they're ages two through 12. We usually have around 16, 18 aquatic facilities throughout Palm Beach County that participate in this swim program. In order to apply, all the parent has to do or caregiver is go to our website at www.pbcgov.org forward slash DPC, which I will put um, in the chat. So that way you can take down that information. But as I said, uh, it's free for individuals with special needs, particularly with those with autism. Uh, they are eligible for three certificates. Each certificate is good for a minimum of six to eight lessons in the water. We are funded by the Palm Beach County Board of County Commissioners and the Children's Services Council of Palm Beach County. So we are actually a government entity, not a nonprofit, which oftentimes people get confused. Now, why should we care about water safety and drowning prevention, particularly with uh, the autism community? Well, children with autism, they're especially attracted to water. So that's why Project Lifesaver is really good and all these other organizations that have present, you know, presented thus far is phenomenal. Uh, we're here for the community and to pay close attention to those with autism. Go ahead, Jackie. Okay, so hopefully all of you can see this, but this is some of the resources that are available for children with autism. This actual brochure is also on our website. So you're more than welcome to go to our website and print that out, or you can call me and I can send you some. That's not a problem. As I said, my name is Anna Stewart. My number is 561-616-7068. That's my email. Normally, we're out in the community doing water safety presentations. Now we're doing it virtually. So water safety is a year-round proposition, and we just want everybody to be water safe and water smart and to utilize the free services that our organization provides. Thank you, everybody. Excellent. Thank you so much, Anna. Some more great information. Um, next, I would like to introduce Liz Schmidt, the Director of Aquatics and Community Water Safety for the YMCA of South Palm Beach. 
Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I wanted to uh, just share with everybody some of the resources. We've heard a lot today um, that drowning is um, a really significant risk to um, our children and um, adults with autism. And so what to do, where to go. Um, and so I want to talk a little bit about a, a program we have at our YMCA. We offer an adaptive aquatics program. And um, this program is really um, designed for um, families who have kids with special needs. Um, it's completely run separate from our other programs, our other water safety and swim lesson programs. Um, and we work with the families, um, most importantly, on funding. So every year we work um, to get funding dollars, um, the Y does, to support this program. Um, and so we offer significantly reduced cost one-on-one -on -one swim lessons for kids with special needs. Um, and so we work a lot with uh, CARD um, to get families connected to us. All of our programming um, happens within our indoor heated aquatic facilities um, and all of our staff in the program are trained um, working with kids with special needs. Most of them actually do work in the Palm Beach County school system um, as their day job and then they, they do this on nights and weekends um, to help support and teach kids how to swim. Um, and this program really came about because we saw a need in our community for swim lessons and quality programs programming uh, for kids with autism. Um, we also work with young adults and adult programs as well. So if anybody um falls into those categories. We don't just uh, work with one specific age group, but we work across um, across the gamut. Um, in addition to that, we provide these one-on-one -on -one lessons for $30, which is a significant price in decrease um, than what you'd see for other one-on-one -on -one programs. Um, during co the COVID shutdown, we knew that water safety was such an important part of what our community needs. We offered um, free water exploration. So our YMCA's opened up in June. And upon opening our Y's, we started bringing back our um, kids and families in our program um, to be able to, um, to be able to provide um, water safety so that they could continue to be in the water, to be safe around the water. And what we're really doing is we're teaching those rules, um, much as what the doctors described um, in the first part of the presentation. Um, we're really working with these kids and families to teach them rules around water safety in real time. So talking about setting boundaries, um, talking about the boundaries and the rules with going into the water, going near the water, wearing a life jacket for some of our kids and families is so important. Um, because of those skills that they may or may not be able to obtain. So working with those families, not only with the kid, but also with the parents on water safety, um, making sure that they understand. Our staff talk to all of the families individually about what are water hazards in your home. We know elopement is a big issue. Um, and so our instructors do um, an intake with each family. Upon the intake, they discuss what are the water hazards in your home? Do you have a pool? Do your neighbors have a pool? If our parents say they don't know, we ask them to go check see what's around in your community and, and what are some of the hazards that our kids could come upon. Um, and then we go from there and we do uh, work with those kids during the lesson and talk with them about some of those hazards that they might encounter when they're not in our program. Um, but most importantly, we're teaching them safety. Um, we do find a lot of our children really do um, enjoy coming to the lessons. And so we've taught kids um, to not only be safe around the water, but then we continue lessons um, into full on strokes um, and, and eventually joining swim team. Um, as a swimmer and an advocate for the competitive sport of swimming, it is an awesome sport for kids with autism um, because it's individual, but it's team. Um, and so we work with a lot of our uh, middle school age kids um, and those families um, potentially going into swim team as a sport um, because they can compete um, at, on the same team um, with neurotypical children. And so we see um, that's a really awesome way for those kids to all be together and be inclusive. Um, and so we, we start that right in our swim lessons. So if anyone has any questions, I see there's a couple in the chat, so I'll go ahead and answer those. Um, but uh, you can go ahead and find me. Um, my email is lschmidt at ymcaspbc.org, or you can go to ymcaspbc.org and under programs, click on adaptive aquatics. And I'll go ahead and answer the questions in the chat. Great, thank you so much, Liz. Um, just a, a quick announcement. We've had so much really good information and um, we still have more to come, but we are running about 10, 15 minutes behind schedule. So just sort of a heads up if you're able to stay on with us, we'd, we'd love to have you uh, remain, but just a heads up that we are a little bit behind schedule. Um, but next, I would like to introduce um, Deputy Scott Poritz with Palm Beach County Sheriff's Office.
Can you hear me, Scott? There we go. Can you guys hear me now? Yes, we can hear you. Yeah, it would help to unmute. All right. I just want to thank CARD for uh, asking Palm Beach County Sheriff's Office to participate in this. Uh, it's a really a, a exciting um, webinar to participate in and, and hear all the wonderful, uh, you know, views and how everybody's, you know, geared towards building up the autism community and helping the autism community. And we, we do several things within the Sheriff's Office. Um, one of the first things that we um, engage in is uh, our Project Lifesaver, uh, which um, Dr. Scott talked about in a little bit earlier, uh, Jacqueline mentioned it, and then also, uh, you know, Gene Saunders. Um, for our personal tracking devices, uh, we are part of the program. Um, we've expanded it um, tenfold this past year. Uh, instead of just having a few people within the agency, um, we have spread it out to every single district. We have what's called our um, PTP liaisons, uh, where they are continually working with the individual deputies, um, training on the, the equipment. Um, we've got the personal tracking device uh, in our helicopters. Um, we've got the equipment to put in our cars. And then as we narrow things down, um, we have the handheld when we need to go out on foot. Um, and it's a, it is a, a wonderful uh, program and uh, a service that we're able to participate with uh, for positive results. So that's one of the things that uh, we do in the sheriff's office um, when it comes to you know autism community. But we also, uh, for those with dementia and con other con dis cognitive conditions um, as well. Um, and then we also have what's called our crisis intervention teams. Um, crisis intervention for us is uh, an emergency mental health care aimed to assist individuals uh, who are in a, a mental health crisis situation. And, you know, ultimately the goal uh, is to minimize the potential risk uh, for mental health harm um, to self or others. Um, and then we have our crisis intervention team, uh, which are uh, law enforcement um, deputies. Uh, we have correction deputies, communications personnel, and civilians who receive uh, specialized training in this um, for mental health crisis related calls in addition to our regular duties. So the CIT members are specifically trained to address these mental health crises when a call comes in. Um, CIT members are preferred responders when we do work with the citizens with mental health issues. Um, and then we have our behavioral services unit, which is an interdiscipline division of federal, state, local law enforcement, case managers, mental health counselors, clinical social workers, marriage counselors, and therapists who provide crisis intervention for um, prevention to members of the public that might um, have risk. Um, and then, you know, we do our annual law enforcement training with CARD, uh, which is very important. The more training that we have for our deputies, uh, the better interaction we have when we are uh, responding to a home with someone with autism. Um, and that brings up, you know, when we do respond to a home with autism, it's usually for negative reasons most of the time between law enforcement and fire rescue. Um, and several years back, um, I was working for the village of Wellington, which is the Palm Beach County Sheriff's Office, uh, and a card reached out to them to see how we could bring awareness and resources to the Western communities. Um, and with that, um, I was brought in to assist with that. Now, I'm not geared towards autism, but I was good at building um, events. Uh, you know, autism is my wife's wheelhouse. She's a BCBA. So um, through this, I leaned on her as well. Um, and through the partnership with CARD, uh, we created what's called the Day for Autism, Building Bridges with Law Enforcement Picnic. Um, and it's an opportunity for the autism community to come out um, and interact with law enforcement. Um, it's all done through sponsorship. Um, community has really pitched in to help pay for things. Uh, first year it was on the smaller side, but we provided food, interactive games. Um, last year, unfortunately, we had to cancel it uh, due to COVID, but we do have a tentative target date for this year of February uh, 13th, and where we provide food, interaction, 20 different vendors. We have a touch a truck event, um, interactive games, uh, a DJ, uh, trackless train, uh, bounce house, uh, you know, anything and everything that we can do where we build that gap between law enforcement and the autism community. And this is in hopes that maybe just maybe, you know, when we do respond to a home, 
they see the uniform and hopefully maybe that can, can become a calming mechanism. Uh, but it also gives our deputies firsthand um, interaction with, with families and um, you know, not just responding to the home when it's a negative reason. Um, they, they do the art projects with the kids. They'll eat with the kids. Uh, we had a few deputies dance uh, the previous year with the kids. So um, this is constantly growing. Uh, for those that were supposed to participate in it last year, uh, you'll be getting the save the date here pretty soon. Um, I have to give you know first rights refusal to those that were going to participate. And then unfortunately, if those that were going to can't, uh, then we'll open it up to a little bit more of the, um, the public. So, and you know, with that, again, thank you um, for having the Sheriff's Office participate in this, and I'll be here to answer questions as well. Excellent. Thank you, Scott. Um, next, I would like to introduce Jeff Hines, Fire Safety Specialist with Palm Beach County Fire Rescue. I'm actually Anna Stewart. I just changed clothes if you look at the video right there. Um, no, thank you. Hello, how's everybody doing? Yeah, I'm Jeff with uh, Palm Beach County Fire Rescue. So as far as the fire department, pre-COVID, you know, we do a lot of station tours. We, especially, well, personally, I've done station tours for the autistic community. And depending on the, the severity, you know, I've done everything from having the trucks turn on their lights, turn on their sirens, which, you know, get perceived different ways. Sometimes it's, it's really scary to the kids to letting them try on bunker gear, a lot of touch and feel, hand them the gloves, let them try them on some, you know, put everything on and take great pictures and have fun. And some are a little hesitant, but it's just to get them comfortable and familiar with what's going to potentially happen. Obviously, if there's an emergency or fire and the fire trucks come, there's a lot of people, a lot of noise, a lot of people look different. So one of the biggest concerns when it comes to fires in particular is, is hiding. The, uh, the autistic community will have a, a habit of hiding, which obviously makes it a little bit more difficult for the firefighters to find them. And they're, they're scared of the firefighters in the bunker gear, which goes back to, you know, if you can get into a fire station and you can you know, let the kids or the, or the, the autistic uh, community see, feel, touch, and, and see what the stuff looks like, it, it helps. But with COVID right now, unfortunately, the stations are shut down from the education standpoint. I'm just like Anna, we're doing everything virtually. Um, you know, if anybody is interested, we can still do virtual tours. Um, you know, we can play sirens and, and horns and show gear and all that. So it's still an, an, an option. Uh, the other big deal is uh, to basically have somebody responsible for the autistic person. Um, because one of the big things is they may try to re-enter the house or the building um, to go find an object. Um, which is bad. Um, people re-entering, the odds of them coming back out are pretty slim. So um, it's a little bit of a gray area because we say, you know, when the smoke detector goes off, get outside and don't re-enter. But if, if you have a person that doesn't understand how to get out, you got to come up with that pre-fire plan at your house to make sure that, you know, everybody knows where they're going to go and what they're going to do. The last thing you want is, you know, mom and dad going for child. You want one adult, one parent getting outside. So if something happens, at least one parent survives the fire. So appoint somebody to be responsible for that person. Make sure when you get outside that someone's still with that person because you don't want you know, anybody wandering off. Uh, smoke detectors, uh, everybody has them. Hopefully they work for everybody. Uh, we're all pretty guilty of the fact that we don't change the batteries till they beep in the middle of the night and then we either break them or rip the batteries out. Uh, many studies out there, basically when you go to sleep, your nose goes to sleep. By the time you smell the smoke, it may be too late. So be proactive in your house, change your smoke detector batteries. The, uh, the battery companies say when you change your clocks, change your batteries. That's a little excessive, but try to do it at least once a year. And you know, if there are autistic people, you know, make sure they're outside their bedroom, make sure they have one inside their bedroom and make sure you sound it so that they know what it sounds like so that when it does go off and it is loud, they're not scared and they don't hide. They know how to get outside. And we, we should be practicing fire drills at least two times a year so that you know, we know how to get out, we know the past, we know what to do. And then just do, you know, teach the basic fire safety, the stop, drop, and roll. We stop, drop, and roll when we are on fire. I've been doing this job for many years. A lot of kids say you stop, drop, and roll when the house is on fire. It's not when the house is on fire, it's when you're on fire. When the house is on fire, you get outside, right? Um, touching the door with the back of the hand, you know, so they can feel if the door is hot or warm and then teaching that if it is hot or warm, to not go out the door, but potentially go out the window. But here again, that's another teaching um, experiment that you have to do to teach them how to open the window and how to get out the window. Um, so depending on you know where, where the person may be on the spectrum, you have to adapt that. And here again, practicing a fire drill will, will teach everybody what to do. Um, once again, visit the fire station. And then one of the biggest things is just prevention. You know, lock up the matches and lighters, put safety covers over, over the stove knobs. Stoves now have a lot of the push buttons things, but 
You know, a lot of people don't think anything's bad is going to happen until something bad does happen. We do a uh, juvenile fire setter uh, course here for juveniles that have started fires. And it's, it's incredible the amount of young kids from five to, you know, just even call 15 teenagers who have started fires just because they came across matches and lighters that, you know, parents left out and they were bored and they started something on fire and it got bigger and bigger. So you got to be proactive, pick those things up, keep those things out of reach, keep them in a locked box, um, be proactive for any of those hazards that are around. So once again, we're doing everything uh, virtually. Here's my contact information. Uh, feel free to give me a call, shoot me an email. Uh, like I said, we have the capabilities through virtual to walk around a fire truck, show you lights, sirens, show you bunker gear, do education. Um, we're here to help you. Obviously, it's the new 2020, but you know we're, we're here and we have the capabilities to uh, get the information out. So thank you for your time and please reach out if you need me. Appreciate it. Excellent. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you. Your collaboration. And la our last uh, organization, and certainly not least, we have Oriana De Leon, the Injury Prevention Coordinator for Safe Kids of Palm Beach County. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. It's nice to be here. So nice to see so many resources out there available for um, these families and children. So very, very happy to be here. Thank you, Jackie, for having us. Um, Next slide. So we are Safe Kids of Palm Beach County. We are a injury prevention program. We are part of Community Partners of South Florida and we are fully funded by the Children's Services Council. Next slide, please. Okay, uh, Safe Kids, our mission is to keep all kids safe from preventable injuries as preventable injuries is the number one killer of children in the United States. Uh, next slide. And you can do next slides. Okay, um, Safe Kids Palm Beach County, we focus, like I mentioned, and um, different types of programs to try to prevent injuries, um, educate the community of what they can do um, to prevent their children from having any injuries. So we focus on road safety, home safety, sport safety. Uh, we have a ton of information. Family can also go on to safe, um, safekidsworldwide.org and um, also go in there and find um, home safety information if the family needs to know how to, you know, baby, baby prove their homes. There's a ton of information there, um, home checklists that will go over all of this information. Um, and also one of our biggest program is child passenger safety. Um, some of the calls that we get sometimes from families of children with autism is that they're having challenges keeping their child um, re properly restrained, restrain, sorry, because they either unbuckle their seats or um, they know how to remove their seat belts and things like that. Uh, we do have a couple of uh, technicians that are special needs certified that if the families have any questions, we can refer them to one of them and have and help the families with what should be the next step and which seat will be best for their child to keep them properly, properly restrained in the car. Um, another thing that I want to mention, uh, we have our Safe Kids program and we provide pro uh, affordable car seats to the community for a donation fee of $35. Um, also, if a family needs a car seat check, we are able to do that at no cost to the family. At this time, we are doing virtually. Pre-COVID, we have several um, um, stations around uh, throughout Palm Beach County to help with parents checking their car seats. However, now because of COVID, we are doing everything virtually. So if the family has any questions in regards to that, please um, have us give us a call. Um, and also, if families have any questions regarding um, seats for their children uh, with autism, if they're having challenges keeping them probably restrained, they can also contact the National Center for the Safe Transportation of Children with um, Special Health Healthcare Needs, and they will be able to provide them with more information. Um, next slide. And we do have our Facebook page, so please feel free to share with your families. We are constantly updating information um, to provide to families on how to keep on how to keep their children safe at home. Next slide. And 
We are a small but mighty team. We cover the whole uh, entire county. Uh, so we're here, we're here to help. So please um, give your families this information, have, us, have them contact us and we'll do the best we can to help them with their questions. Thank you, Jackie. Excellent, thank you, Oriana. Um, most of the questions that have come through have been answered by our panelists in the chat box. Um, so I would encourage you to, to kind of scroll through to see what has been asked and answered. Our panelists have been really good about answering the questions. Um, are there any, if there are any last minute questions right now, we can, uh, you can put them in the chat box. Otherwise, I will hand this back over to Dr. Scott to um, just say thank you to all of our, our attendees and our presenters today. Um, and in just a second, we just had a question come through. So where is the best place to go for resources in Palm Beach County? Um, for autism related resources, I would encourage you to contact us at FAU Card. Our contact information is up here. Um, that is primarily what we do is helping families to get connected with different resources and supports um, across kind of the gamut of, of topics, whether it's educational, um, healthcare, behavior, any of those things. I do, um, do encourage you to reach out to Card and we'll get you set up with a, a clinician um, to provide support. Great. Thank you, Jackie. And I want to thank all the uh, agency representatives that participated today. Uh, thank you. And uh, our sponsors, uh, um, Rails uh, Jewish Family Services and Butterfly Effects. Uh, it's great to hear the good work that's happening there. The FAU card program has taken the lead statewide and uh, nationally in terms of promoting safety for children with autism. This is a huge, uh, huge issue. We, the data on this are not as sharp as they need to be. Uh, most death certificates won't indicate if a child has autism. So we really don't know. Um, if we did know, I think we'd be much more scared than what we are. But parents who are informed, who are paying attention, who are doing the right things, uh, getting the right support, um, they, they need not be unduly uh, freaked out about, about this kind of thing. So uh, I, let me restate, if, you, if you're having any issues related to the safety of your child, please work with your card specialist, contact me. You see the number on the screen and we'll be happy to do all that we can do to help you um, maintain the safety of your loved one with, with autism. So, and realize that the things you do to keep your child with autism safe will keep other children safe as well. And uh, thinking along those lines will help everybody stay, stay safer. So uh, thank you all for participating. And we'll um, see you in, uh, not too far down the road, maybe face to face as well. Thank you. Thank you.